Okay, so welcome everyone. I suggest that we start. And first I would like to welcome ACI for welcoming us uh, during this convention. So this is part of uh, uh, a trend that RILEM and ACI are getting closer, collaborating on many topics. And I think it's a very nice symbol to have this uh, uh, medal awarding ceremony today here in Detroit. So uh, I will start uh, before giving the, giving the stage to the two uh, awardees. I will start by saying a few words about RILEM. So to, today we are here for the Gustavo Colonetti medals, uh, which are medals that RILEM gives to uh, researchers uh, with uh, being less than 35 years old. Uh, who have proven their ability to do some impressive international transversal research. And um, these medals uh, are one of the, uh, some of the awards given by RILEM. Uh, we have many different awards. And uh, RILEM is uh, an association that, considering the faces I see in this room, you all know. But if you want more information, you can find some on uh, social media, and uh, if you want some really uh, funny and entertaining information, you can go to our YouTube channels. On these YouTube channels, you will find some videos of uh, the main lectures we were, were given by the medalists from the previous years, so some very interesting things. And um, uh, RILEM is an international association. We are here at ACI, but we have relations and a collaboration with uh, FIB and some uh, I mean, strong and important association dealing with construction materials. Uh, it was founded in June 1947, uh, just after the Second World War, to bring together the scientists uh, and engineers dealing with construction materials and promoting scientific cooperation, but as well trying to accelerate the rebuilding of uh, the countries that were destroyed by the war. It is now 1,200 members. And uh, of course, it's far less than ACI, but the proportion of members that are very active in our RILEM technical committees is very high in RILEM. And uh, we are quite international, although we still have a very strong European base. And uh, the RILEM members are spread all around the world, and we have some uh, local uh, RILEM uh, organizations uh, in some uh, strategic and fast uh, research developing areas in the world. Uh, the work of RILEM is organized in technical committees. We have around 40 technical committees at the moment, and they produce technical recommendations that can be used, that are often used in pre-standardization. And uh, these technical committees produce as well publication and state-of-the-art reports. These technical committees are organized in different clusters. As you can see, ACI is about concrete, RILEM is about construction materials. So we have uh, some clusters that are really focused on concrete because it's, as we all know, the most used construction material on this planet. But we have things about masonry, timber, uh, or uh, black products such as asphalt, asphalt and bitumen. Uh, RILEM is organizing many conferences, workshops, we have some educational activities in the field of PhD trainings. And if we have a look at the events that were organized on the period from 2012 to 2016, we can see that RILEM is active all over the world, uh, with, of course, a strong focus on the our European base. But uh, I mean, if we look at the way this map is drawn, Europe is in the middle. So the traveling distance, from a theoretical point of view, is shorter if you organize things in Europe which of course is totally wrong. But uh, we have many uh, events that are sponsored, co-sponsored, or organized by RILEM. Uh, one of them, oh, we have many, but I, I chose one of them because it's, for us it's a very important one. It's uh, the RILEM week, so during which most technical committees gather, meet, work together, and uh, it is often in parallel with a conference, and the next one will be in Chennai in India in September 2017. And um, the program is, is very interesting, very broad, and, uh, and it will be, I think, uh, an amazing uh, RILEM week once again. Uh, RILEM is uh, managing the journal Materials and Structure. So the impact factor for last year is uh, 2.453. And uh, editor-in-chief at the moment is Pietro Lura for EMPA. And, uh, and the journal, as 
been going through changes recently with uh, an electronic format, uh, a continuous article publishing, uh, which had allowed us to really increase the speed at which papers were submitted, reviewed, accepted, and published. So the journal is in very good health, and uh, I'd like to draw your attention on the fact that Rylam started a new journal recently. It's an open access journal. It's called Rylam Technical Letters. Uh, so I really invite you to go and check this website because as it's open access, all letters can be downloaded for free and are fully accessible. And the specific thing for this journal is that uh, it's not only free to download and read, but it's as well free to write and publish as long as you are a Rylan member, as one of, one of the co-author is a Rylan member. So I think it's, it's a very nice move because uh, if you look at associations like ACI, Rylan, FIB, I mean, people are contributing by paying their membership, and a small part of this membership can be used to make this type of journal, and this journal do not cost as much as what Springer, Elsevier are telling us it costs, and then it means that you can have your own journal, and it can be open access and available and free and open to all, and it can be really a tool to uh, distribute and spread knowledge for communities. Uh, so. Open access is something that Rylam has been doing for a long time because you can download all the production of TC for free if you are a Rylam member from a website, all conference proceedings. And this journal is just a continuation uh, of, of, this, uh, of this move and this trend in Rylam. So today we are having this uh, ceremony for the medal. So the Gustavo Colonetti is a young medal. It was created uh, three years ago. and. Uh, we have uh, the pleasure to welcome Professor Gorafsand from UCLA and uh, Professor Enrico Sassoni for University of Bologna. So they're going to, to give each of them a lecture presenting their work. They had a free, total freedom on what they want to, to present today, but I'm sure it will be great. Uh, anyway, it has to be great because if it's not, then I will keep the medal. <laughs> uh, but uh, I'm, I'm sure it will be. So um, I would like to welcome Professor Gorafsand to give the first presentation, and we will keep a bit of time for questions after each presentation, and then I will give the medal after the two presentations. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, thank you very much for having me. It's, it's a great honor. Um, so like Nicholas said, because I would like to get the medal at the end, I'm going to try my best to give a good talk. Um, nevertheless, so I changed the title of my talk just a little bit. Um, I'm going to, in, in general, speak about silicate dissolution behavior in cementitious environments with focus on really looking at rate controls and the implications on reactivity and durability. Um, I, before going any further, I should, of course, point out that this was work which was done by lots of other people. Um, I only do my bit of presenting it, but I'd especially like to acknowledge Isabella, Tandre, Aditya, Kevin Field, Boo, Jan Leipap, Narayanan, who's no longer here, um, Jeff Bullard at NIST, and my colleague Matthew Bauschi, um, who've all played a role in the work that I'm going to speak of today. So just a little bit of an idea of what I'm going to talk about to sort of set the stage um, for what follows. Um, I'm going to start with talking about why silicate reactivity matters and in, the, in two specific contexts. So I'm going to talk about a context of fly ash reactivity, um, and I'm then, then going to go on to talk about the next part, which is on aggregate durability and a little bit of work that we've done, which is of relevance to nuclear power plants. Of course, I'm going to go through trying to talk about what materials we've worked with and the measurement methods that we've used, um, looking at ascertaining what I will talk about as, as the rigidity of atomic networks, talk a little bit about trying to bring all of this together within the same framework by linking network rigidity and dissolution rates within a common theme. Go on to the summary and conclusions and acknowledgments as follows. So really, this, this question of silicate reactivity was something that we started thinking about maybe four years ago now. Um, and it was, it was in general directed towards how do you really achieve higher utilization rates and more informed utilization with fly ash when either you use it to replace bottle and cement or whether you use it in the context of trying to produce your polymers. Now, when you do want to be able to replace, let's say, fly ash by Portland cement, we are, of course, aware that these materials are less reactive than OPC. However, the question that really persists, and I would say 
continuous process even now in some sense, is there's no rapid means to link composition and reactivity and structure together for fly ashes or for other SCMs. Um, very often this is sort of considered in the context of, oh, they've got an amorphous phase, they've got a crystalline phase, et cetera, but we don't really have a good means to take fly ash A and fly ash B, which might, for example, both be low calcium ashes, and say just based upon composition and structure which one, which one is more reactive than the other. So really the first question that comes about is how do you really ascertain the dosage and the suitability for OPC replacement? And how do you really start to discriminate different fly ashes from each other? Now, of course this is important because there's choices that when you select a fly ash, you've got to deal with the consequences, the properties that follow. So very often you can hear the story about, well, we used a fly ash to replace Portland cement, we had an extended setting time, we didn't get the strength that we wanted at 28 or 56 days. These are important questions to be thinking of. Now, while current standards do look at the question of compliance, um, for example, whether a fly ash meets a class C designation or a class F designation, they do not answer the question of performance. So really, I think the first question to, to lead in with is, is there a way to assess the reactivity of the, glass, the glassy components in a fly ash? And I'll tell you why I focus on the glassy components in a little while. And then link its composition and structural features to reactivity, which would be, for example, a surrogate of performance. Um, of course, we want to focus on the glassy compounds because they are dominant, and I'm going to speak specifically in the context of fly ashes in general for everything that we've seen. The glass makes up at least about 65% of the fly ash, if not more. Um, of course, you'll find this one-off fly ash which has 50% glass, but I think broadly speaking, 65 is about a good number to be looking at, so you want to look at really the dominant component. And when you look at the effects of performance, for example, this is just an example of seven-day strength, but these are all class F fly ashes going from the blue circle to the gray diamond. And you can see that starting right at even seven days, you can see a clear difference in how they all behave. So there's really a question of why. Now, if you go from seven days to even a later period in time, you see that these differences continue to persist. And so it becomes quite important to consider, for example, well, why do different fly ashes show different reactivity? And how do you really rank and assess and identify reactivity quantitatively? The next example that I'm going to talk about is really this business of aggregate durability and some work that we've done with nuclear power plants. So the work that I'm going to talk about was actually motivated by an observation at the Seabrook Power Station in, on the East Coast, in, which was identified and came really, I would say, into the public forum in 2009. Specifically, alkali silica reaction was detected at Seabrook, and there was a question that was raised that, well, of course, we understand that this has impacts on service life and it has impacts on cost. But really, what is the origin and the prognosis that's associated with alkali silica reaction? The question that was specifically important to address in this ca case is, can ASR be induced because of radiation exposure? So the question is, well, why is this really important? So there's quite a bit of work which has been done, I would say about maybe over the last 50 years or so, where people have taken concrete and they've exposed concrete which contains different aggregates to neutrons. Um, so this might be either simulated neutrons or it might be real neutrons in test reactors. And you see sort of interesting trends, and this is data that was compiled by Kevin Field at Oak Ridge maybe about two or three years ago now. And if you look at the relative compressive strength, you see that up to a given point of neutron exposure, there's basically no change in the compressive strength. And then you see there's a really sharp fall off. Now the question that really becomes important in this context is, well, really why? Um, so looking at some of these things, it was it was determined that it's important that we should try and understand what's the effects of radiation. Now, that being the case, there are two things I'd like to point out. So, of course, based upon work that has been done in the past, it's, it's reasonably clear that you get mechanical damage following radiation exposure. But in addition to the mechanical damage, is there really an underlying chemical cause that's associated with it? So specifically, are you getting issues, for example, related to amorphization of aggregates um, due to radiation exposure, which set about irradiation-assisted alkali silica reaction? So that's really the question that we were trying to answer, and I'll talk about what our findings were as we go forward. So really going on to how we decided to probe this, it's of course good to spend a little bit of time on the types of materials and the methods that we've used. So really the first thing that I'll talk about is this business of fly ash reactivity. So of course the f when looking at fly ash reactivity, we started with looking at about seven different commercial fly ashes. Um, the fly ashes that we were using, of course, spanned, I will say, classic ASTM 6618 style class C and class F designations. So class C is basically calcium rich. Class F is less calcium rich. They still contain calcium, just not as much. Um, but there in itself you sort of identify one of the failings of, of the compliance-based approach. 
But we looked at these fly ashes and we went through what everyone else would do. We looked at things like X-ray fluorescence, we looked at the mineralogy of the fly ash using quantitative diffraction, we looked at compositional mapping using uh, energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy, and spent quite a bit of time trying to use the XRF, the X-ray fluorescence, the simple oxide data and the mineralogical data to be able to determine what the average glass composition is. Now, of course, we do appreciate, for example, since we do have quite a bit of the SEM data done, um, this was work that was, I think, originally done by Ryan Chansey, Maria, and Paul Stutzman, maybe about five, six, seven years ago, something like that. We, of course, do understand that there's a lot of heterogeneity in the composition of the glass in a fly ash. However, that heterogeneity is not really very useful because while you can map it, what it means is really not clear. So we wanted to see what we can really determine from the average glass composition. The nice thing about doing the subtractive method of trying to take the XRF data and trying to remove all the crystalline compounds from it is you're left with the average composition. So it's quite a straightforward process. You basically just do a mass balance calculation, which yields the composition of the glass. Now, with regard to the aggregates, we took a slightly different approach. So while in the context of fly ash, we were trying to stick much more with, I will call it, reality, in the, in the context of um, looking at aggregate durability, we took a much more synthetic route. So specifically, we started with looking at 100 one surfaces of quartz and calcite. Um, we were looking at quartz and calcite because they're often present in concrete aggregates. I'm not really going to focus on calcite since I'm going to try and stick to the theme of silicates. But we looked at these crystals in two forms. So we looked at them in what I will call as a pristine form. So they were used basically as is, as synthetic single crystals. And then we ion implanted them. So basically, we took a heavy ion gun. So we were using argon ions, accelerated at 400 keV and we were impacting them onto these single crystals. Now, if you really think about what ion implantation or irradiation does, you know, I can explain this two ways. I can explain this with an ordered crystal structure and tell you there's an energetic particle, and I can tell you the things move, and you can cause vacancies, and you'll get displaced atoms. Or I can go back to a game I played many years ago. So if you start to look at the idea of billiards, you've got an incoming particle that's accelerated towards an ordered structure. So your ordered structure is, of course, a crystal structure. And you can start to tell as you transfer kinetic energy from an accelerated particle into a crystal structure, you get displacements. An important thing to note is that you're getting quite a bit of disordering. So what was originally a very ordered case now looks very disordered. The nice thing is you can ascertain this kind of disorder using what's known as selected area electron diffraction. So you do it within a transmission electron microscope, and you can really start to tell very, very closely where the original atoms were and where they may have moved, as an example. But an important thing to point out, um, as, as you look at this cartoon over and over again, you will notice that going from the original structure, which looks like this, to this one, there's quite a significant increase in volume. And that's an important point to point out, because if you just take the first order view, you can start to explain why you get mechanical damage following irradiation. You're getting aggregates, which are going to expand, because you're going to get reductions in the density. As they expand internally within a constraint system against a restraint offered by the cement paste, you cause microcracking. So that's the first order explanation of why you would get mechanical damage following radiation exposure. Now, to look at the idea of irradiation a bit more scientifically, of course, you can do what's known as selected area electron diffraction. And what I want you to consider is really two things. So I want you to look at these two images right here, what those images really show. The first one shows, if you look at quartz under a transmission electron microscope, specifically in SAD mode, you can get what is known as the sharp diffraction maxima, and you can see these six ordered creatures right around it. So this is quartz like it originally was in the pristine form. If you take quartz in a, and you irradiate it, all of this completely vanishes, and you've got essentially only the central diffraction maxima and nothing else. So what you're really seeing is this, is this example where quartz is being completely amorphized, right? So this is how you would actually examine it, amorphization at the atomic scale. So since we know that quartz is going from a well-ordered structure to something which is quite a bit disordered now, the first question that comes up is really what is the impact on the physical and chemical properties, for example, for example the dissolution rate. Um, if we want to probe, for example, something like alkali silica reaction, this is a good thing to be looking at. So with that said, um, the question comes up as to how you want to measure dissolution rates. And what I will say is there's a lot of different ways to do it. We've spent quite a long time now, maybe about actually seven years. In fact, since I started where I am, we're trying to use vertical scanning interferometry to measure dissolution rates. So the idea of using vertical scanning interferometry is actually quite straightforward. It's a combination of what I will say is an optical microscope, so a typical microscope that you look at through an objective, 
and an interference microscope. So the idea of really trying to put these two things together, the optics with the interferometry, is actually quite straightforward. When you use a traditional optical microscope, you're limited by the diffraction limit of the optics. So essentially, this is described, for example, by the Raleigh criteria or, or Abbey's diffraction limit. But long story short, it's very difficult to get resolutions which are better than about 200, 100 to 200 nanometers. Now, the nice thing about doing interferometry is if you couple it with an optical microscope, you can, of course, see the X and the Y, as you usually would under high magnification. But you've got a beam of light which you shine down on the surface. So you, as you shine the beam of light on the surface and you get the reflection back, since you've got a reference that's associated with it, you track the movement of the interference fringes. And the nice thing about the interference fringes is because you're looking at beam splitting, but depending on whether you have constructive or destructive interference, you essentially null the signal or you amplify it. But the nice thing about this is you can resolve this theoretically to about one angstrom. Practically speaking, in a thermostated laboratory, you're probably much closer to about five angstroms, um, not one angstrom. But nevertheless, you've got tremendous resolution in the Z direction, which is quite good to have. The other thing which actually makes these interferometers very, very powerful is that you can do very large areas. So you can do areas which are thousands of microns square. So we will routinely look at areas which are, for example, a millimeter by millimeter. And while that sounds very small, I assure you it's actually really, really large. Um, and you can do this in real time. So you can actually do it as surfaces dissolve away. And you can see what happens on a surface. So to give you a little bit of an example of what the strategy really involves. So I'll give you, I'll give you the quick example of what, what you need. So you can imagine that you've got a little sample that looks like a really, really small hockey puck, and you've got two parts on it. You've got the sample surface, but right next to the sample surface, you've got some sort of a reference. And one criteria that the reference really has to satisfy is it has to be inert. Now, the reason you need an inert reference is interferometry in, in, in this manner is a relative imaging approach. So you essentially need one surface that can move and one surface that stays fixed. And based upon the relative displacement between the two surfaces, you get an indication of mass loss or mass gain. Of course, um, you want to be able to compare these surfaces really well. So when we've used references, we're typically using things like PTFE or synthetic diamond, which makes for pretty expensive experiments, at least in the second case. But you've got incredibly inert systems to be looking at. And that's really something that's quite important to have. Depending upon the systems that you're looking at, if you're looking at something, for example, on, on the order of a pH 10 type of solution, you can even use quartz. Um, of course, you want to use synthetic quartz, not, ideally not things which have inclusions in them. But you really need to be careful about what you're doing, because as you can imagine, if you've got five angstroms of resolution, if you don't have an inert reference, you're going to get results which are rather bizarre. Um, and having been through the experience, I'll tell you that that's actually true. Um, when these samples are mounted, you, of course, want to have some sort of a fiducial mark on them, but you can also use what are known as kinematic stages. So these things will do positioning to be able to reposition samples over and over again to about within one microsecond, um, so to speak. So you can do really, really very repeatable imaging of the same areas over and over and over again. So what does this really look like? So if you want to try and quantify dissolution rates, for example, um, from what I will call surface retreat, the surface retreating away from its original position, you can imagine that you've got a sample surface that looks like this. Now, again, just one thing to point out, the nice thing about interferometry is you can do it with really, really highly polished planar surfaces, or you can do it with particles. So the way these interferometers work is you've got an effective measuring range of about 300 microns. So as long as your particles are smaller than 300 microns, you can actually measure them. Um, and this is something that makes the, the approach really quite powerful. But you can imagine that we've got a surface, and this is an inert surface. So this is actually mask of the silicone mask, which is the inert part, so to speak. And you've got some particles on it. As you go out in time, let's assume that I take the surface and I dip it in a bucket of water, and I bring it back after a couple of hours. After three hours of contact, you can see that the particles are eaten away a little bit. I take this back, I put it back in my bucket, and I bring it back after a few more hours, and you can see the particles are eaten away yet more. If I plot the change in height of the particles as a function of time, and you can do this particle by particle, of course you can imagine the slope of the line reveals a dissolution rate. So this is really quite nice because you've got a very straightforward means of being able to assess something like dissolution. Now I will point out that the reason that this is quite a good approach is unlike doing solution concentration measurements, which depending upon the right kind of mineral are also exactly equivalent, for example, for something like calcite, you get exactly the same answers whether you use interferometry or whether you use something like ICP OES, where you actually measure solution concentrations. On the other hand, if you're looking at glasses, for example, which can dissolve incongruently or form these alteration layers and surfaces, 
the results that you can get from solution concentration measurements can be pretty misleading because you've got significant incongruency in the solution. The nice thing about interferometry is it gives you an actual mass loss, which is nice because you don't need to make any presumptions about the mechanism of the solution. And this is the reason why we chose to use interferometry for this specific work. So going on to talk just a little bit further about this idea of what is the rigidity of atomic networks. Um, this is some work which was actually first developed by my colleague, uh, Matthew, and then when Matthew started U at UCLA, we started working on this quite a bit more. But really, the approach is based upon doing molecular simulations of solids. Of course, it works really well for silicates. Um, there's some limitations to the nature of compositions you can encompass. Silicates, aluminosilicates, aluminates, very straightforward. Other things, less so. But really, the first thing you want to start with doing, if you want to do any of these, I'm going to say atomistic or first principles type of calculations, you need to construct an atomic structure. Now, of course, if you've got a crystal, this is very straightforward. You've got a known crystallographic orientation. You've got known files which have all of the atomic positions that are identified for you from refinements that people have done in the past. You can take it, and you can use this as an input, and you've got your atomic structure. If you're trying to do a glass, now this becomes much more complex because the problem is, while you know which atoms go in and perhaps in what proportions, you don't know what position they should be located in. So you need to go through this, I'm going to call it a melt quench procedure, where you need to heat the system, for example, something like 4,000 Kelvin. You do this so that it removes all of the memory of its initial configuration, and then you cool it. And when you cool it, you're cooling the system at one Kelvin per picosecond. So it's incredibly fast. Now, the reason you want to do it is that if you hyperquench the system, of course, you get something which is perfectly morphized. Once it's hyperquenched, you relax the structure, and now you've got an atomic structure you can work with. So this is work that was done by some of our postdocs in LAMPS, which is one of these large molecular simulators, which was developed, I believe, at Los Alamos quite a few years ago now, um, and with a caveat being that you can do it with both classical or semi-classical interatomic potentials. So for the work that I'm talking about, we've actually used an, a semi-classical, or what you would call a reactive interatomic potential called REACTS-FF that was developed by William Goddard um, and some of his postdocs and students maybe about five or ten years ago now. So the idea of molecular simulations was something that was actually quite important, specifically in the context of radiation damage, because radiation damage is actually really, really difficult to detect when you're using an experimental method. The problem is as follows. You can detect a system that is pristine, and you can detect a system that is completely amorphized quite well. The intermediate states are much harder to get. For the simple reason being that, you know, the, the changes are progressive and they accumulate. So the accumulation is really what you want to track, but it's actually very hard to get. Now, of course, the nice thing is computers allow you to do essentially anything you want, which is quite good, because what you can start to do within these molecular simulations is you can take a particle and you can accelerate it into a collection of atoms. As it impacts with the atom, for example, the primary knock-on atom, and it displaces things, you move things along in what you, in what you would call a displacement cascade. Of course, this is really a billiards game, because even when we do this in molecular simulation, we do it using, for example, realistic coordinates and realistic positions. However, you do not consider any of the electronic effects that are associated with irradiation. So you do not consider, for example, any interactions with any of the atomic subatomic particles. You don't consider any interactions with the nucleus, as an example. So really, what we were interested in doing, and I'll talk about this in a second, is we were interested in quantifying, for example, first, the evolution of the density, because, for example, you can imagine that these things are going to experience a reduction in density, and the network rigidity, um, which I'll talk about in just a second. So just to give you an idea of what happens when you do some of these molecular simulations, you start out with something that with, you start out with alpha quartz, which looks kind of like that. You can tell that it's well ordered. You've got your silicon atoms that are surrounded by all the oxygens, et cetera and you expose it to radiation. Eventually, you end up with a system that looks kind of like that. Clearly, you can tell there's quite a bit more chaos going on down here as, compo as compared to the ordered crystal structure you've got at the top. So besides examining this visually, how do you really yield some quantitative metrics that are associated with this is really what we're going to lead into. So when you want to start to look at an atomic network's rigidity, of course, um, being a civil engineer, you can start to create some very, very simple, I'm going to say, analogies. And what you can start to look at is really this idea of Maxwell's criteria that was used, for example, to analyze a truss. So the idea of Maxwell's criteria is really quite straightforward. Systems can be statically determinate or indeterminate based upon the degrees of freedom and the number of members that you have. So if you've got, for example, a system that consists of four nodes, one, two, three, four, which could also be atoms, which are joined by rigid members, you've got a system which is flexible or floppy. The question is why, because if I push on the system, 
it pushes over. Then you can consider another case where you've got the same system, but then you add a central rigid member. If you've got a central rigid member, you can determine quite quickly, just on visual inspection, that that's a system that's rigid because it's no longer going to push over. You can go out yet further and cross-brace the system yet once again. And you can imagine that this system is going to be much more rigid or stiff as compared to any of the rest. So of course, the nice thing about this is determining based upon whether these systems are statically determinate or indeterminate, you can come up with an idea that this is a system which is isostatic, where all of the conditions of equilibrium are perfectly fulfilled. This one is under constrained, um, so you'd call it flexible or floppy. And then the system, which you basically would call indeterminate um, or hypostatic, would be stressed rigid. Now, the nice thing about this idea, that though it's very simple, um, you can actually use it to determine what atoms do within a network. And the approach is as follows. So you can think about a central atom within the network, kind of like this, and you can determine, based upon excursions, what is the number of permissible bond stretching, so BS stands for bond stretching, and bond bending constraints. So you can imagine that if you've got two atoms that are joined together, based upon the amount of thermal energy that you provide, you can stretch them apart and pull them back together to equilibrium positions. So this is the bond stretch. And then you consider, you consider the bond bend, which is that direction, right? So of course, you want to be able to assess whether the bond stretching and the bond bending constraints are either fulfilled or not. Now, the nice thing about this is depending upon what is the extent of excursion that you get, the extent of displacement you get, the extent of angular displacement you get, you can determine whether a given set of constraints is either fulfilled or not. So of course, if a set of constraints is completely fulfilled, you end up with a rigidity number or the number of constraints of three. If it's under constrained, so you've got fewer constraints than you want, you get a number which is less than three. If you get a set of constraints which is fully, fully which is fulfilled and yet more, which is the stressed rigid case, you've got an NC value, number of constraints value, which is greater than three. So the nice thing about this is that just using, for example, the fact that you've got three degrees of freedom, three dimensions, and you're looking at stretching and bending criteria associated with atomic bonds, you can come up with an indication of network rigidity. Now, really, if, if I just provide a bit of an example with what happens, for example, to physical properties and network rigidity, um, I want you to start with really considering the number of constraints as a function of accumulated energy. And what this is really an example of is alpha quartz, which is exposed to radiation. And you can start to tell it starts at a network constraint value of about 3.7. As you expose it to more and more and more radiation, the number drops. So you go from a system that was originally stretched rigid, so you can imagine that this is a very stiff system to a system which now eventually can be pushed over. This is quite an important thing to point out um, because the first thing that you can start to tell is that as you go from a system which is ordered to disordered, so essentially structured to morphized, you're losing rigidity. Um, so once we've got this idea of rigidity clarified, the question is how do we really start to link rigidity with dissolution rates? So the first thing that I'll start with saying and I want you to keep in mind is when we consider network rigidity as we are, and we're looking at dissolution rates, we're looking at dissolution rates very early in time. So we're looking at what I will call as unconstrained dissolution. So we're not waiting for ions to come into solution and hinder the dissolution of the solid once again. This is, for example, this remote dissolving in a bucket of water about as big as this room, right? So you're always going to maintain dilute conditions. These are systems which are always undersaturated. You don't have to worry about things like precipitation, et cetera, which are going to influence the solution rates. So the first thing to start looking at, really, and I'll start with a simple case of silica and quartz, two classical silicate solids. It's well known that silica dissolves faster than quartz. But if you ask the question, well, why is that so? The answer that you get is always qualitative. The answer is silica has got poor order, right? Or it doesn't have a well-defined crystal structure. You don't really get any quantitative metrics that are associated with it. One thing I want you to note is that you go from quartz, which is pristine, uh, doesn't matter whether it's a single crystal or polycrystalline, the, the pink crosses show you polycrystalline quartz, to quartz following irradiation. It actually perfectly starts to match the dissolution rate of amorphous silica. So the reason that this is important, the first thing to point out, is you're getting about a three orders of magnitude increase in dissolution rates by simply amorphizing quartz. So the question is, of course, how does this link to atomic topology or the number of constraints and hence to reactivity? So really the first thing, you can, first thing that you can start with doing is you can plot the dissolution rate as a function of the number of constraints. And you're seeing this for a couple of different pH levels for quite a few different solids. So essentially things going from a sodium silicate glass to silica 
to nepheline, jadeite, and albite, which are aluminosilicates. These are the glassy versions, and quartz. The interesting thing that you can start to tell is that you can get perfectly exponential dependencies. You can, you can see that this is a semi-log plot, so you start to get exponential dependencies of dissolution rate and the number of constraints. Now, the reason that this is quite good is what, we, what you're really seeing, this trend, is defined by an equation that looks kind of like that, where the dissolution rate is, the, is a function of an intrinsic dissolution constant and an exponential term, which has the number of constraints and a number E naught within it. What's interesting, or at least to us, is that this is very Arrhenius-like. It looks like a classical Arrhenius relation where you can start to determine what this E naught number is. You know what the number of constraints is. K naught is basically just your intrinsic rate constant. It's your pre-exponential factor. That's what you want to call it. But the nice thing is you can start to tell E naught takes a value of about 25 kilojoules per mole. So what this really is, is it's telling you the energy that's required to rupture a unit constraint. Now, this is actually quite important because you're now starting to be able to lend some quantitative energy numbers that are associated with taking a solid and transferring it from within itself to into the solution. Now, an important thing to point out, which is related to this, um, is, and I'll come back to this in a second, is I'll make the case that the energy required to break a unit constraint is also related to other features, to other processes, specifically things like diffusion, dissolution, and conduction. But an important thing that you can start to tell very quickly is if you consider an Arrhenius-like relation, this term up here, NC times E naught, basically reveals the activation energy of the process. Now, this is quite an important thing because one of the things you want to start to understand is how the atomic topology relates to a rate determining step. So we wanted to figure out, you know, so starting with this initial premise that the activation energy equals NC times E naught, does this actually really work? So we measured the dissolution rates of quartz in amorphous silica across a range of temperatures, so essentially going from, I think, 5 degrees Celsius to 65 degrees Celsius, and we looked at what the activation energy of dissolution was. So for silica, we see an activation energy of dissolution of about 52 kilojoules per mole. For quartz, we see an activation energy of about 100 kilojoules per mole. When we do this NC times E naught business, we determine that the activation energy for quartz dissolution is about 95 kilojoules per mole and about 72 kilojoules per mole for glassy silica. Now, this is actually really quite good because what this tells you is that you are actually able to get an indication of the activation energy. When you start to look at this in a broader context and you look at activation energy as a function of number of constraints, for four different solids, sodium silicate, potassium silicate, silica glass, and quartz, where you're looking at processes including dissolution, which is under water, diffusion, which is at high temperature, so you're essentially looking at the movement of species at high temperature, and conduction, where it's ionic hopping at high temperature, you can start to tell that the topological prediction basically follows quite well with what the activation energies of all of these processes are. Now, this is really quite good because what it suggests is that, first of all, these processes seem to have a common topological origin or an origin which is based in the network, so to speak, but it also suggests that there is a common energy barrier, and that's really the rigidity of the network. Now, this is actually quite good because what this suggests that a lot of these processes which are related to transport, for example, related to protons penetration or related to ion hopping or which are related to hydroxyl attack where hydroxyls start to penetrate into, into solid structures, they are all related to a key network transport step, which is quite good because it starts to give you an indication of where all of these things are. Now, an important thing to point out, of course, is that if you sort of go forward and start to look at the same thing which is applied to fly ash, you start to see something very interesting emerge. That once again, just like we saw with these, I'm going to call them pure solids, even if you take this rather messy glass system that you have in fly ash, the topological scaling relation does follow. Now, this is actually quite good because even if you take a step further and you take all of the scaling that you've got right here, which is associated with the fly ashes, and you start to plot the dissolution rate, for example, this is at pH 12 and sodium hydroxide, for fly ash glasses with that of natural glasses, which is things like, for example, um, sodium silicate glass that you can find, quartz, or with other things that you can get, for example, things like albite and jadeite and nepheline, which you can synthesize, for example, in a glassy form, this topological scaling relation actually still holds quite well. Now, of course, I will point out that when, you've got, when you're looking at a fly ash glass, the value of E naught drops. And th that in and of itself is actually not surprising because in a fly ash glass, where you have a lot of these network modifiers, you should expect to get a slightly lower rupture energy. It should be easier to dissolve than some of these, I'm going to call them fully compensated systems. And this is really quite nice because what it starts to tell you is that dominantly the E naught value the rupture energy, so to speak, is broadly controlled by the network silicate and aluminate structure. And that's, I think, quite an important finding because it really starts to give you an indication that if you want to be able to look at dissolution, 
rather generically, you know what to be looking for. It's really the network features. So, of course, um, just to sort of take the next step and really try and rationalize reactivity and durability, um, it's important to first point out that for silicate solids, um, fly ashes and concrete aggregates, it's possible to reconcile reactivity within a common thermodynamic framework. And I think this is really quite a significant outcome because a lot of these things that we've, I'm, I'm going to say, struggled to have put within a consequent sense can now really start to come together. If you start to take really the, pra consider the practical consequences that are associated with this, um, number one, this can start to offer the ability to establish guidance to rank fly ashes, for example. Um, this is quite a significant thing. We've got a paper coming out in the Ceramic Society Journal which actually shows how to do this. You can start to predict aggregate durability in nuclear plants. Um, for example, you can exactly start to tell as a function of the radiation exposure what's the rate at which aggregates might dissolve and whether this is going to cause, for example, issues related to alkali silicon reaction. But more importantly, it also gives you a mean to really start to look at being able to qualify aggregates. Of course, this is not the easiest way to do it using interferometry, but you've at least got a, the ability to be able to do it because if you're able to assess the dissolution rates of aggregates, you're able to get a direct estimate of what's the risk and sensitivity that's associated with things like alkali silicon reaction. So, of course, why do we talk about this? Um, you know, it, it, it really draws a comparison sort of to the halide series. When you've got the halides going from astatine, which is, I think, the rarest element that you can find in the earth naturally, to fluorine, the difference across the halide series from the bottom to the top is the net attraction for electrons. This is extremely attractive. This, attractive, but not very much. And so this is really what it gives us the ability to do. It lets us really start to put things within a quantitative sense. You can really start to use classical chemical principles to be able to explain why different things react at different rates and how you start to quantify this. So of course, going on to the summary and conclusions, um, what we've done is applied, I would say, a pioneering combination of interferometry and MD simulations to assess network rigidity and reactivity features. Um, the significant outcome, really, of this work is that it helps to elucidate a topological framework by which you can rationalize the different composition and structure-dependent reactivities of a range of silicate solids, including fly ash and minerals that comprise concrete aggregates. But as an academic, of course, this is important to me, and I think it's important to really be able to extend our understanding and ability to model some of these systems. It allows reactivity and durability to be quantified and modeled within a consistent thermodynamic framework. And I think that's really quite a significant outcome. So of course, um, I think acknowledgments are of course due. I'd like to especially acknowledge Isabella, Tanre, and Aditya, who've been a part of this work from the very beginning. Um, Matthew, for lots of discussions over quite a few years now. And I'd like to acknowledge financial support from COMAX, which is a consortium that we run at UCLA, the National Science Foundation, the Department of Energy, which funded the work on radiation damage, and the US Federal Highway Administration. And with that, I'd like to conclude. So um, very quickly, I think, I think one, of the, one of the things that we're really trying to do at this point is develop a much more consistent sense by which we can take some of what we've learned and be able to model some of these systems. So really of how you take the next step from, I'm going to say, the fundamental pieces here and extend them to a slightly more practical context. So of course, we're interested in things like fly ash reactions. Of course, we're interested in other things which are related to, for example, alkali silicon reaction. Um, I, I think this is really where it leads. The, the question is, if you take this work and you try and look for practical impact, I would say that those two are probably directions where there's quite a bit of practical impact. Thank you very much. Sure. Interesting. I may have missed something, but along the way, in talking about these reactivities and, and network rigidities, and then pH got introduced. Yeah. I don't remember you saying terribly much about the pH issue. Right. So, one, so one. What influence that has? Okay. So basically, it has no influence. So pH makes a difference in so far that as you increase the pH, you increase the rate. But as you can tell, these lines remain perfectly parallel to each other. 
So because they remain parallel to each other, what that suggests is the value that's associated with the rupture energy does not change. Rather, what is changing is the pre-exponential number right here. So that's really the thing to point out. So of course, while pH does increase the solution rates, in the, con in the, in the context of being able to analyze the data and, and look at the, really the development of the framework by which you can analyze this, it has no impact. Yes, Doug. Interesting talk. The, uh, in terms of the radioactive damage to the aggregate in a reactor building, you're going to get a radiation flux that decreases through the thickness right. of the wall. Right. So I can see that a lot of radiation is likely going to maybe even move the inner part of it to the maximum flux because of the yellow bits of that cut. You don't see it happening through the thickness. Um, so it's, it's, it's a question of time, Doug. Right? because it's a question of how long you're going to let the reactor run. Um, a lot of this work was really motivated by the idea of the second license renewal. Because as you start to get into the second license renewal, there are two problems that start to come up. Number one is your effective flux is quite a bit higher, or the fluence is quite a bit higher. The other problem is you've also got much longer periods of time for the gradient to diminish deeper and deeper into the section. So think about something like the biological shield. You've got, of course, you've got, a, you've got the highest exposure on the, on the inner surface. You've got a low exposure on the outside, but that propagates inward. Now, the reason that that turns out to be a problem, and if you think about why, is if you've got expansion that starts off at the inside, which is asymmetric across the radial direction, the problem is the hoop stress is also not symmetric. And that's an interesting circumstance, because the way these things are designed, they're typically designed for reasonably symmetric forces, except in the case of shock. So that's the reason why it's important to be able to understand how this actually propagates through the section. So there's actually some quite a few transport simulations that have also been done at Oak Ridge to be able to look at some of this work and look at the progression of the flux as it travels in. And the hoop stress is a problem. So. So here's, here's the thing. Of course you can do this. You can do this with what's, what are known as glass compensated or liquid compensated objectives. The problem is you lose a tremendous amount of resolution if you do it under immersion. So as an example, um, the, the, there are a couple of problems with it. When you're doing interferometry and it's done under immersion, imagine you've got a thin liquid film. You've got a surface. You've got a liquid film. You've got a glass, an optical window. And then you've got the objective, which is actually looking through all of this. The compensation that you do needs to be dynamic because it needs to account for changes in temperature and it needs to account for changes in concentration in the solution as it dissolves. Because as the refractive index changes, you need to compensate for it. So it turns out to be quite a mess. So it's in fact easier to develop a system for repositioning accurately once you remove the sample than doing glass compensation. So we abandoned glass compensation some time back. It's a good question. Um, what I will tell you is that based upon our observations, we've not been able to see a change in topography that is dramatic. So for example, we've tried a couple of different things that you take a sample, you dry it rapidly. The way we're doing it is we're essentially taking compressed air and blowing things off the surface of the sample. It causes a problem because, for example, if you have a loosely attached alteration layer, you might peel it back. But things of this sort you can identify. In certain cases, we've seen that there are issues. So things which have, for example, very high solubility but crystallize very fast, we've seen issues. With things of this sort, which are not very soluble, we've not seen problems. Sodium chloride was a problem, I will tell you that. 